The Continued Story of Taryn, the Assistant Pig Keeper. I'm glad you've stayed to listen. Now sit round, as Papa Bear reads a story. Chapter 5. The Huntsman of Anuvan. The pack horses shrieked in terror. Melonlass reared as arrows rattled among the branches. Fluter, sword in hand, spun his mount and plunged against the attackers. Adon's voice rang above the din. These are huntsmen! Fight free of them! At first, it seemed to tear and the shadows had sprung to life. Formless, they drove against him, seeking to tear him from his saddle. He swung his sword blindly. Melonlass pitched furiously, trying to break away from the press of warriors. The sky had begun to unravel in scarlet threads. The sun, rising against the black pines and leafless trees, filled the grove with a baleful light. Terran now saw the attackers numbered among a dozen. They were jackets and leggings of animal skins. Long knives were thrust into their belts, and from the neck of one warrior hung a curved hunting horn. As the men swirled around him, Terran caught his breath in horror. Each huntsman bore a crimson brand on his forehead. The sight of it filled Terran with dread, for he knew this strange symbol must be a mark of Auron's power. He fought against the fear that chilled his heart and drained his strength. Behind him, he heard Alanmi cry out. Then he was seized by the belt and dragged from Melonless. A huntsman tumbled with him to the ground. Closely grappled, Terran could not bring his sword into play. The huntsman raised himself abruptly and thrust a knee against Terran's chest. The warrior's eyes glinted. He bared his teeth in a horrible grin as he raised a dagger. The huntsman's voice froze in the midst of a triumph of yelling, and he suddenly fell backward. Eladir, seeing Terran's plight, had brought down his sword in one powerful blow. Thrusting the lifeless body aside, he shoved Terran to his feet. For an instant, their eyes met. Eladir's face, below a blood-streamed mat of tawny hair, held a look of scorn and pride. He seemed about to speak, but turned quickly without a word and ran toward the fray. In the grove, there was a sudden moment of silence. Then a long sigh rippled among the attackers as though each man had drawn breath. Terran's heart sank as he remembered Gwydion's warning. With a roar, the huntsmen renewed their attack with even greater ferocity, dashing themselves against the struggling companions in a surge of fury. From a stride Melonlass, Elony fitted an arrow to her bow. Terran hurried to her side. Do not slay them, he cried. Defend yourself, but don't slay them. Just then, a hairy, twiggy figure burst from the scrub. Gurgi had snatched up a sword nearby as tall as himself. His eyes shut tightly. He stamped his feet, shouted, and swung the weapon about him like a scythe. Furious as a hornet, he raced back and forth among the huntsmen, bobbing up and down, his blade never still. As the warriors sprang aside, Terran saw one of them clutch the air and spin head over heels. Another huntsman doubled up and fell, pounded by invisible fists. He rolled across the ground in an attempt to escape the buffeting, but no sooner did he climb to his feet than a shouting, thrashing warrior was flung against him. The huntsmen lashed out with their weapons, only to have them ripped, ripped from their hands and tossed into the scrub. Against this charge, they fell back in alarm. Dolly! cried Terran. It's Dolly! Adon took this moment to plunge forward and seize Gurgi and hoisted him to Luger's back. Follow me, Dodon shouted. He turned his mount and shot past the struggling warriors. Terran leaped to the back of Melonless. With Elenry clinging to his belt, he bent low over the horse's silver mane. Arrows flew past him as Melonless streaked ahead. Then the stallion was clear of the grove and pounding across the open ground. Ears back, Melonless galloped past a line of trees. Dry leaves flew in a whirlwind beneath churning hooves as the stallion sped to the brown crest of a hill. For a moment, Terran dared to glance behind him. Below, a number of huntsmen had separated from the band, and with great strides, held to the track of the fleeing companions. They were swift, even as Gwydion had warned. In their jackets of bristling skins, they seemed wild beasts rather than men. As they spread in a wide arc across the slope, as they ran, they called out to one another in a weird, wordless cry that echoed almost from the brooding crags of Dark Gate itself. Cold with dread, Terran urged Melonless on. Clumps of grass rose high among fallen tree trunks and withered branches. Ahead, Luger galloped down an embankment. Adon had brought them to a riverbed. Dark water lay in a few shallow pools, but for the most part it was dry, and the clay banks rose high enough to offer concealment. 
Adon reined in Luger and cast a quick glance behind him to make sure all had followed, then beckoned the companions to move forward. They set off at a rapid gait. The riverbed wound its way through high-standing firs and tattered alders, but after a little time, the embankment fell away and a sparse forest became their only cover. Although Melonlass did not slacken speed, Terran saw the pace had begun to tell on the other horses. Terran himself longed to rest. Dolly's shaggy pony labored through the trees. The bard had ridden his own mount to a lather. Eladir's face was deathly pale and he was bleeding heavily from his forehead. They had not, as far as Terran could tell, stopped hastening westward, and Darkgate lay some distance behind them, though its peaks could no longer be seen. Terran had hoped Adon could have fallen back toward the path they had used earlier with Gwydion, but he knew now that they were far from it and traveling still further. Adon led them to a thin, dense thicket and signaled them to dis dismount. We dare not stay here long, he warned. There are a few hiding places Aron's hunters will not discover. Then stand and face them, cried the bard. A flam never shrinks. Yes, yes, Gurji will face them too, put in Gurji, although he seemed barely able to lift his head. We shall stand against them only if we must, Adon said. They are stronger now before than before, and will not tire as quickly as we will. We shall make our stand now, Eladir cried. Is this the honor we gain from following Gwydion, to let ourselves be tracked down like animals, or do you fear them too much? I do not fear them, Terran retorted, but it is no dishonor to shun them. This is what Gwydion himself would order. Elenmir, though exhausted and disheveled, had not lost the use of her tongue. Oh, be quiet, both of you, she commanded. You worry so much about honor, when you'd be better off thinking of a way to get back to Carrot Gadarn. Terran, who had been crouched against a tree, raised his head from his hands. From a distant came a long, wavering cry. Another answer, voice answered it, then another. Are they giving up the hunt? he asked. Have we outrun them? Don shook his head. I doubt it. They would not pursue us this far, only to let us escape. He swung stiffly to Luger's back. We must ride until we find a safer place to rest. We would have little hope if we let them come upon us now. As Ildir strode to the weary Islamak, Terran took him by the arm. You fought well, son of Penlikur, he said quietly. I think that I owe you my life. Ildir turned to him with the same glance of contempt Terran had seen in the grove. It is a small debt, he replied. You value it more than I do. They set out once again, moving deeper into the forest as rapidly as their strength allowed. The day had turned heavy with dampness and chill. The sun was feeble, wrapped in ragged gray clouds. Their progress slowed in the tangle of under underbrush, and the wet leaves mired the staggering animals. Dully, who had bent over his saddle, straightened abruptly. He looked sharply around him. Whatever he saw caused him to be strangely elated. These are fair folk here, he declared, as Terran rode up beside him. Are you sure? Terran asked. How do you know? Though he looked closely, he could see no difference between this stretch of forest and the one they had just passed through. How do I know? How do I know? snapped Dolly. How do you know how to swallow your dinner? He kicked his heels against the pony's flank and hurried past Adon, who halted in surprise. Dolly jumped down and, after examining several trees, ran quickly to the ruins of an enormous hollow oak. He thrust his head inside and began shouting at the top of his voice. Terran, too, dismounted. With Elenwi at his heels, he ran to the tree, fearful the fatigue and strain of the day had at least driven the dwarf out of his wits. Ridiculous, muttered Dully, pulling his head of his tree, out of the tree. I can't get that far wrong. He bent, sighted along the ground, and made incomprehensible calculations on his fingers. It must be, he cried. King Idleg wouldn't let things run down this badly. With that, he gave a number of furious kicks against the tree roots. Terran was sure the angry dwarf would have climbed into the tree itself had the opening at the trunk been slightly larger. All are reported, Dully cried. Yes, the idle egg himself. Unheard of. Impossible. I don't know what you're doing, Eleni said, brushing past the dwarf and stepping up to the oak. But if you'd tell us, we might be able to help you. As the dwarf had done, she peered into the hollow trunk. I don't know who's down there, she called. But we're up here, and Dolly wants to talk to you. At least you can answer. Do you hear me? Eleni turned away and shook her head. They're impolite, whoever they are. That's worse than somebody shutting their eyes so you can't see them. A faint but distant voice rose from the tree. Go away, 
it said. Dully hurriedly pushed Elenmi aside and ducked his head back into the tree trunk. He began shouting again, but the dead wood was so muffled the sound that Terran could distinguish nothing of the conversation, which consisted mainly of long outbursts from the dwarf, followed by brief and reluctant answers. At length, Dully straightened up and beckoned the others to follow. He set off at a great rate directly across the woodland, and after a little more than a hundred paces he jumped down a jutting bank. Terran, leading the dwarf's pony as well as Melonless, hastened to join him. Adon, Eladir, and the bard turned their mounts rapidly and were soon behind them. The bank was so steeply inclined and overgrown that the horses could barely keep their footing. They stepped delicately among the brambles and exposed rocks. Islamok tossed her mane and whinnied nervously. The bard's mount came near to falling onto her haunches, and even Melonless snorted a protest against the difficult slope. By the time Terran had reached a shelf of level ground, Dully had run to the protected face of the embankment and was fuming impatiently before a huge tangle of thorn bushes. To Terran's amazement, the brambles began to shudder as though being pushed from inside. Then, with much scraping and snapping of twigs, the whole mass opened a crack. It's a waypost of the fair folk, said Elenmi. I knew they had them every which way, but leave it to good old Dully to find one. As Terran reached the dwarf's side, the portal opened wide enough for him to glimpse a figure behind it. Dully peered inside. So it's you, Gwistel, he said. I might have known. So it's you, Dully, a sad voice replied. I wish you'd given me a little warning. Warning, cried the dwarf. I'll give you more than a warning if you don't open up. I don't like we're here with this. What's go what good is a waypost if you can't get into it when you have it? You know the rules. If any of the fair folk are in danger, well... That's what we're in now. On top of everything else, I could have shouted myself hoarse. He gave a furious kick to the brambles. The figure heaved a long and melancholy sigh, and the portal opened wider. Terran saw a creature which, at first glance, looked like a bundle of sticks with cobwebs floating at the top. He realized quickly the strange doorkeeper resembled certain of a fair folk he had once seen in Idleg's kingdom, only this individual seemed in a woeful state of disrepair. Unlike Dooley, Gwistel was not of the dwarf kindred. Though taller, he was extremely thin. His sparse hair was long and stringy. His nose drooped wearily above his upper lip, which in turn drooped toward his chin in a most mournful expression. Wrinkles puckered his forehead, his eyes blinked anxiously, and he seemed on the verge of bursting into tears. Around his bent shoulders was draped a shabby, grimy robe, which he fingered nervously. He sniffed several times, sighed again, and grudgingly beckoned Dully to enter. Gurgi and Fluter had come up behind Terran. Gwistel, noticing them for the first time, gave a stifled moan. Oh no, he said. Not humans. Another day. Perhaps. I'm sorry. Dolly, believe me, but not the humans. They're with me, snapped the dwarf. They claim Fairfolk protection, and I'll see they get it. Fluter's horse, slipping among the branches, whinnied nervously, and at Gwistel, Gwistel's clapped a hand to his forehead. Horses, he sobbed. That's out of the question. Bring in your humans if you must, but not horses. Not not horses today. Dolly, I'm I'm simply not up to horses today. Please, Dolly. He moaned. Don't don't do this to me. I, I'm not well, not well at all, really. I wouldn't think of it. All the snorting and stamping and big bony heads. Besides there's no room. No room at all. What place is this? Eladir questioned angrily. Where have you led us, dwarf? My horse does not leave my side. Climb into this rat hole, the rest of you. I shall guard Islamok myself. We can't leave the horses above ground, Dully told Gwistel, who had already begun to retreat into the passageway. Find room, or make room, he ordered. That's flat. Sniffing and groaning, shaking his head, Gwistel, with great reluctance, heaved the doorway open to its full width. Very well, he sighed. Bring them in, bring them all in, and if you have any others, invite them as well, it doesn't matter. I only suggest an appeal to your generous heart, Dully. But I don't care now, it makes no difference. Terran had begun to think Gwistel had good reason for concern. The portal was barely high enough for the animals to pass through. Only with difficulty did Adon's tall steed enter, and Islamok rolled her eyes frantically as the thorns tore at her flanks. Once past this barrier, however... Terran saw they had entered a kind of gallery, long and low-ceilinged. One side of it was solid earth, 
the other a dense screen of thorns and branches, impossible to see through, but with enough cracks and crevices to admit a little air. You can put the horses in there, I suppose, sighed Gwistle, fluttering his hands in the direction of the gallery. I cleaned it not long ago. I wasn't expecting to have it turned into a stable. But go ahead, it doesn't make any difference. Choking and sighing to himself, Gwistle led the companions through a damp-smelling passageway. On one side, Terran noticed an alcove had been hollowed out. It was filled with roots, lichens, and mushrooms, the food stock, he guessed, of the melancholy inhabitant. Water dripped from the dirt roof or ran in rivulets down the wall. An odor of loam and dead leaves hung in the corridor. Further on, the passage opened into a round chamber. Here, a small fire of sod flickered on a tiny ash-laden hearth and gave out frequent puffs of sharp, nose-tingling smoke. A disorderly pallet of straw lay nearby. There was a broken table, two stools, and a vast number of bunches of herbs hung against the wall drying. Some attempt had been made to smooth the sides of the wall itself, but here and there the twisting fingers of roots poked through. Though the chamber was intensely hot and stuffy, Gwistel shuddered and pulled his robe closer about his shoulders. Very cozy, Fluto remarked, coughing violently. Gurgi hurried to the fireplace, and despite the smoke, flung himself down beside it. Adon, who could barely stand to his full height, seemingly paid no attention to this order, but went to Gwistel and bowed courteously. We thank you for your hospitality, Adon said. We have been hard-pressed. Hospitality, snapped Dully. We've seen precious little of that. Get along, Gwistel, and fetch something to eat and drink. Oh, to be sure, to be sure, mumbled Gwistel. If you really want to take the time, when did you say you were leaving again? Ellenby gave a cry of delight. Look, he has a tame crow! Near the fire, on a tree limb fashioned into a crude perch, crouched a heap of shadows, which Terran realized was indeed a large crow. With Ellenby, he hurried over to look at it. The crow resembled more a lumpy ball, with straggling tail feathers, feathers as wispy and disordered as Gwistel's cobwebby hair, but its eyes were sharp and bright, and they appeared at Terran critically. With a few dry clicks, the bird polished its beak on the perch and cocked its head. It's a lovely crow, Elanui said, though I've never seen one with feathers quite like it. They're unusual, but very handsome once you get used to them. Since the crow did not object, Terran gently stirred the feathers around its neck and ran a finger under the bird's sharp and gleaming beak. With sadness, he remembered the fledgling Gwythaint he had befriended, long ago it seemed, and wondered how the bird had fared. The crow, meantime, was enjoying an attention it evidently did not receive option of, often. It bobbed its head, blinked happily, and attempted to run its beak through Terran's hair. "'What's his name?' Elanui asked. "'Name?' answered G Gwistle. Oh, his name is Ka, because of the noise he makes. You see, something like that, he added vaguely. Ka, exclaimed Fluter, who had been watching with interest. Excellent! How clever! I should never have thought of giving a name like that. So original! He nodded in pleasure and approval. While Terran smoothed the feathers of the delighted crow, Adon set about examining Eladir's wound. From a small wallet at his belt, he drew out a handful of dried herbs, which he ground into a powder. What? said Eladir. Are you a healer as well as a dreamer? If it does not trouble me, why should it trouble you? If you do not choose to take it as a kindness, Adon answered, unperturbed in continuing to treat the cut, take it as a precaution. There is hard and dangerous travel before us. I would not have you fall ill and delay us. I shall not be the one to delay you, Eladir replied. I would have stood my ground when the chance was offered. Now we have let ourselves be run to earth like foxes. Gwistel had been peering anxiously over Adon's shoulder. Do you have anything that might be useful for my condition? He asked tremulously. No, I don't suppose you do. Well, no matter. There's nothing to be done about the dampness and the drafts. No, they'll last longer than I. You can be sure, he added in a dismal voice. Stop muttering about the drafts, Dully ordered brusquely, and think of some way to get us out of here safely. If you're in charge of a waypost, you're supposed to be ready in case of emergency. He turned away, furious. I don't know what Idolag was thinking of when he put you here. I've often wondered that myself, Gwistle agreed, with a melancholy sigh. It's much too close to Anuvan for any decent kind of person to knock at your door. I don't mean any of you, he added hurriedly, but it's bleak, nothing of interest, really. 
No, Dolly, I'm afraid there's nothing I can do for you, except set you on your way as quickly as possible. What about the huntsmen? Taryn put in. If they're still tracking us... Huntsmen? Gristle turned a sickly greenish-white, and his hands trembled. How on earth did you come across them? I'm sorry to hear that. If I had known before, it might have been possible. Uh, it's too late for that. They'll be all over the place now. No, really, I, you could have shown a little more consideration. You might think we wanted to have them after us, cried Ellen Lee, unable to curb her impatience. That's like inviting a bee to come and sting you. At the girl's outburst, Gwistle shriveled up in his robe and looked more dismal than ever. He choked, wiped his forehead with a trembling hand, and let a large tear roll down his nose. I didn't mean it that way, my dear child, believe me, Gwistle sniffed. I just don't see what's to be done about it, if anything at all. You've got yourself into a dreadful predicament. How or why, I'm sure I can't imagine. Gwydion had led us to attack Auron, Taran began. Gwistel hurriedly raised a hand. Don't tell me, he interrupted with an anxious frown. Whatever it is, I don't want to hear about it. I'd rather not know. I don't want to be caught up in any of your mad schemes. Quidian? I'm surprised he at least didn't know better. But it's to be expected, I guess. There's no use complaining. Our quest is urgent, said Adon, who had finished binding Eladir's wound and had come near Gwistel. We ask you to do nothing to endanger yourself. I would not tell you the circumstances that brought us here, but without knowing them, you cannot realize how desperate we need your help. We had come to seize the cauldron from Anuvin, Taran said. Cauldron? murmured Gwistel. Yes, the cauldron. You pale grub, you lightless lightning bug, the cauldron of Auron's, of Auron's cauldron born. Oh, that cauldron, Gwistel answered feebly. Forgive me, Dolly, I was thinking of something else. When did you say you were going again? The dwarf sees, seemed on the verge of seizing Gwistel by his robe and shaking him. But Adon stepped forward and quickly examined what had occurred at Dark Gate. It's a shame, Gwistel murmured with a sorrowful sigh. You should never have gotten mixed up with that thing. It's too late to think about that, I'm afraid. You'll just have to make the best of it. I don't envy you. Believe me, it's one of those unfortunate events. But you don't understand, Taren said. We aren't mixed up with the cauldron. It isn't in Anuvin anymore. Someone has already stolen it. Yes, I know, said Gwistel with a gloomy look at Taren. Yes, I, I already know. This ends chapter 6. Thank you for listening, and remember, have a good day. You deserve it.